Welcome to the Compagen Popcast. I'm Salvatore, your host. Today, I am joined by Brent Smiley and Bill Ponick from Compagen. We will be discussing device refreshes, and this is a two-parter episode, so be sure to stick around for the second part. Stay tuned. Gents, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Brent, you first. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Brent Smiley. I'm a vice president on the Compton Finance team responsible for our award-winning Green for Good program, as well as some of the financial services that Compton offers. It's great to be here. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Brent. Uh, Bill Polnick here. I'm a customer success specialist. And, uh, you know, my, my job here at Compugen is really to help customers um, understand how to kind of maximize, um, you know, their IT environment and, and, you know, propose some solutions to try to make sure that they're, they're really satisfied with their IT solutions. So i um, glad to be here this morning. Happy Friday, everyone. Yeah, happy Friday. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Really appreciate it. So, um, you know, we're in a new year. Uh, let's let's talk about starting the new year off right. Um, th- the topic today that we're going to be talking about is device refreshes. Now, Bill, I know you're a numbers guy, and um, y- you sometimes, you know, you may question, like, do we need to refresh a device right away? And I know, Brent, with your background, you're all about refreshing devices. So why don't we get into that topic about, uh, you know, when should an organization refresh the devices uh, and, you know, typically how they should go about that. But uh, the first thing we'll touch on is, you know, uh, a refresh cycle. What's what's realistic? You know, Bill, from your take and then Brent, from your take, and we can kind of go from there. Oh my God, that's a huge topic. Uh, there's <laughs> there's so many things to to consider, I, I guess, with the refresh, and um, uh, and 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 every organization is going to be different. Uh, so I, I feel this is great. We're going to have lots of stuff to talk about today. Um, so from from a very high level, and maybe we'll we'll dig into the the different topics um, and the specifics. Uh, from a high level, I would say that the the best refresh uh, cycle for a laptop would be around three years, and um, and traditionally we see about four years on on a desktop, um, just because that product uh, is not moving as much and and sometimes has a little more power. Um, but let's face it, with the pandemic um, and everybody working from home, there's been a huge uh, shift to to really just uh, being mobile and working from anywhere and, and working off a laptop. So I, I guess that, you know, the quick answer to that question is probably three years is the best. Um, but there's, there's lots of different reasons why um, you might choose to do something different or, or there's lots of justification as to why that three year cycle is uh, probably the, the cheapest and, and most effective for most organizations. Um, Brent, I, I don't know what you see on, on your side of the, of, of that question. Yeah, I, I definitely agree um, with your, with your sentiments there, you know, all companies are, are different, um, you know, uh, different types of operations and applications are required. Definitely agree. Um, businesses are shifting towards a three year life cycle for laptops and four year for, uh, for desktops. So we're definitely noticing a, a trend in organizations looking for shorter life cycles on their end user devices. Now, now, guys, when I've gone into, let's say, office buildings or, or let's say retail establishments, sometimes you see computers that are like ancient or hardware that's ancient. So so how come some of these businesses are not taking advantage of device refreshes? What's what are some of the holdbacks you think they're they're running into? <laughs> that's a great question. Um <laughs> Not to make a joke of it, but I, I feel like IT management in those cases just don't don't like their existence. You know, they're they're looking. Some people are are suckers for punishment, and uh, uh, you know, I don't mean to make fun of that, but uh, or make light of it. But um, yeah, when I go when when I talk to customers and 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 I hear that they've got computers for five or six years, um, that, you know, that's really scary. Uh, you know, from a business continuity perspective. And um, an employee productivity perspective, employee satisfaction. I mean, there's so many reasons why that is bad. Um, and and if you peel back the onion, like listen, uh, IT managers uh, and and IT executives make these decisions usually for specific reasons. A lot of it is currency of other other software and that. And and so, you know, customers may have old. Um, so software or solutions in place they've got to be running windows 7 let's say and because they haven't made those investments or they haven't planned ahead um, to replace the software they're stuck with old hardware 
Um, but it's a really bad position to be in, especially with security these days. You got a six or seven year old laptop, you know, that's running Windows 7 that's not supported anymore. And, and, and actually Windows 10 is going to come out of support in the next few years. You, you're really asking for trouble. Um, so there's a lot of things really to dig into, I think, uh, on this call, which is great because I mentioned a few items. Um, Brent, I don't know, like when, when you hear about people that, that, that have computers that are six or seven years, like what's your thoughts? I know there's not much your organization can do um, w for the customer with those systems. Yeah, certainly as, as the devices age um, past that, you know, six, seven year mark, the value um, really, really, really depreciates. Um, so, I mean, my, my thoughts are, you know, maybe they have um, difficulty getting access to capital to purchase equipment or planning or potentially a stretched IT team who just can't, um, you know, have the resources available to, uh, to have a proper evergreen process in place. So, Brent, you, you mentioned something there, depreciation, kind of like uh, when you purchase a car, it depreciates over time. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So uh, how devices depreciate? How do you determine what depreciation is? And uh, is, it, is it something that it, like, is a big factor when you're working with customers on, on refreshing devices? Yeah, great question. And, and absolutely. Um, so, you know, really what dictates the value of Second Life IT assets is the secondary market. What are organizations and people willing to pay for devices based on the age? We find that, you know, the sweet spot for organizations is that three-year refresh cycle. That's where they're really able to maximize the value in their end of first life IT assets. And, you know, one of the big reasons for that is a lot of organizations today are still in that four to five-year refresh cycle. So what that means in the secondary markets is there's less of a supply of three-year-old devices, which means the price points for those are going to be higher because there's going to be fewer of them. They're newer. What we find is when devices get into that four and five year life cycle, the value really quickly drops off. And that's a function of now there's a, a, a more of a supply of those devices in the secondary markets, which is going to depreciate the value on those assets. Um, so, you know, it's encouraging to see organizations um, moving towards that three year life cycle because they're going to be able to maximize the value in those IT assets when they come to end of term and be able to reinvest those cost savings and that trade-in value back into their new IT purchases. That's interesting. So I'm going to go off the rails for a second here and just talk about like the consumer side of things. So, you know, when you, when you lease a car, you usually get a call from the dealership three years out and they're saying, Hey, you want to come back in and get another car and sign you up? Uh, you we're talking about something very similar with our customers in an enterprise market. Do you see this ever going to consumers? Like, like you, you have your average consumer, let's say they buy a laptop that's worth, let's say, $2,200. Why, why, why isn't that a target? Like, and th and this is just us talking. We don't need to, you know, I don't expect to know the answer to this because it's a very random question, but it just piqued my interest because it's like, we get those calls uh, if, if you drive a car, but like, how come um, if you have a laptop or, or technology that has that value, how come the, the manufacturer doesn't want it back from the consumer market? You know, I'm not 100% sure on why there's definitely a difference between consumer grade electronics and business grade electronics they typically have better processors and components so the value that's within those devices is higher as a result um, i i can't speak to why you know big big box stores are not going after consumers that have purchased devices and and working on a trade-in program like we see with say mobility devices bill any thoughts yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I've I've got lots of uh, lots of ideas on on that and and how the consumer market is so much different than the enterprise market. Um, so so listen, I've got two teenagers, and and I know that for the most part, my wife and I would buy technology, and then when the technology was two or three years old, and maybe we're done like uh, the phones and stuff like that, then they would really get transitioned within within the family. You know, so so we would have you know, my wife had an iPhone, whatever. And, and it was three years, she needed a new one. And, and we removed the, the, the data plan and, and, the, and uh, the calling plan off of it and, and moved that to her new phone and just gave that to our son when he was young. So I, I think for the most part in the consumer market, uh, you know, devices get spread around within the families and extended families. And so that's not really a big need. Um, but, but in the enterprise market, uh, there's a huge need um, because re remember, 
you know, when we look at technology, especially in IT, we always focus on the technology and, and we forget about um, the customer, or in this case, the end user. You know, so the, the ID departments at all these enterprises, really they're enabling productivity and, and a productive workforce. And, and so that's what we have to remember here. And so um, when we talk about a three-year life cycle and even, you know, what computers they should purchase, we, we have to understand that, that the cost of fulfilling a role in an organization is more than the computer and the software, which might be a few thousand dollars uh, over the course of a couple of years. It's, it's really, you know, the actual wage and, and the loss of productivity from an employee that, that, you know, can't do their job or is down for half a day because their technology is not working. So, so really, I think, you know, when I'm talking to customers, you know, I remind them that it's about the end user, you know, so, so that's why I think, you know, from the, from the, the consumer space, it doesn't matter so much because if your kid can't play a game, there's no opportunity cost to that. Um, but, you know, getting back into enterprise market, like if you're paying an employee a hundred thousand dollars to do a job, which, which isn't, you know, a crazy amount of money these days. Um, and, and you're spending, let's say $2,000 on a laptop and that laptop's lasting three years. Really, that's a very small part of, of the cost of the employee. You know, it's, it's almost not worth talking about. It's trivial. And so uh, if your employee is down for two days because they've got bad technology, you know, or, or it takes them 20% longer to do most of their day-to-day tasks because, you know, you shorted them on RAM, you went with 8 gigs of RAM instead of 16 gigs, let's say. Um, really, it's a huge impact on an organization. So, so there's lots of interesting the things to consider when you're when you're designing a, a service like uh, i i was fortunate to take um an idle certification a few years ago called service offerings and agreements and really the focus on that is is you're you're designing a business service and, and what's the strategy to that service um and and the design and so i think you know that's one thing that organizations need to understand when they're considering the refresh is is what is the design you know like, like you got to get off the, the napkin and, and stop doing napkin math and look at the big picture and say, you know, when are we refreshing the equipment? You know, we should standardize equipment because that's the cheapest way of delivering services. And, and what level of equipment should we be purchasing? You know, and Brent, I love, I love your future value program. I, I love the whole concept of, of um, discounting the initial purchase. Um, to you know for for companies to discount that initial purchase at the beginning because sometimes if capital um like you may have mentioned is is restricted um you have an opportunity to buy better equipment um and and get that those employees productive right off the stop so that right off the start so um i don't know lots of things i said there kind of kind of went on but uh it's all good it's all good um, but you, you did mention like, um, let's say premium devices versus non-premium. So like, you know, uh, and this might be a better question for Brent, but you know, what, what do you find in terms of devices that are, let's say priced in, let's say the 800 to $1,200 range versus the devices that are priced in the, let's say 1500 to $2,200 range. Like what do they depreciate significantly faster when they're on the lower end of the scale versus the higher end? Great question. Um, and, and. You know, I think just before I answer that question, Bill Bill did mention future value. So for, for those who aren't familiar with what future value is, it's it's a program that CompuGen offers where we provide a trade-in credit up front at the time of purchase. So instead of waiting for your assets to reach the end of their life cycle, we are able to provide that trade-in credit up front. And, and what that does is it reduces the customer's expense on the hardware um, on a three-year term. It could be 15 to 20%. So to answer your question, um, premium devices carry a higher future value credit. So we're seeing those devices up to a 20% uh, future value credit. So for example, if you were buying a $2,000 uh, device, you know we would be able to provide a $400 trading credit up front at the time of purchase, meaning the customer is only spending $600, $1,600 on that particular asset. And, and what that does is it actually puts those premium devices in line with sort of the tier one um, OEMs that we're all very familiar with. And it provides the IT department with the ability to um, provide their employees with premium devices at the same price point as the non-premium devices. 
Um, so that allows the budget to go a little bit further, put some uh, premium devices in the hands of, of the employees. Um, so there's definitely um, an advantage um, from that standpoint. And, and that translates also to the end of the term. Um, premium devices uh, have a higher trade-in value at the end of a term compared to non-premium devices. And you typically see like the premium, the more expensive premium devices, they usually end up in the hands of, let's say, executives or C-level uh, employees at an organization, not typically your um, your analysts or people that are on the lower scale or on the lower side of the pay scale. Is that true? Do you find that happens pretty often that, you know, the more premium devices end up in the hands of executives versus the non? Have you ever seen an environment where it's pretty standardized across the board? Yeah. Hey, I'll chime in on that, guys. Uh uh, cause I've, I've got strong feelings on that. Uh, I, you know, I, I think five years ago you saw that, that, um, that executives had, you know, there was a, a standard for executives and a standard for standard users. And sometimes you even had a standard for, let's say developers, but, um, listen, every customer that I talk to right now are trying to standardize on one product. And, and so the thought is that you're going to just standardize on on one product for all users and it, it actually makes service delivery easier um so so brent i mean you get a lot of of customers coming to you with their fleet um, because they're looking for a buyback or whatever in one of the great programs that you offer and you see a lot of mixed products because you know they've kept devices over you know four or five years and so they've they've introduced a lot of different machines but um do you see that as well that they're not really buying like executive machines because that's that's the trend that i'm i seem to see out there yeah i absolutely agree um i'm noticing more and more um that quotes are having one line item as opposed to having three where you've got your your you know your general employee your developers and then your executives almost three different sort of um categories of of devices um so yeah i'm, I'm definitely noticing that uh, more and more the quotes are simplified. It's it's one device for you know the entire employee base. That's interesting. That's uh, I mean, and it makes sense, right? Like if you only have one device, like for your IT or service department, if you're all working off the same device, it's going to eliminate a lot of the troubleshooting. So you already know, like typically, you fix this device in this method. You don't have to worry about doing it for another device that a certain employee might have. So that's really interesting. Yeah, like if you're if you're in an organization, like every organization has, you know, have has tight budgets these days and you're looking for value for money and and so I think you get the value for money from from fleet management. You know, if you if you're an organization where you have 500 or or 2000 employees, you have to manage things from a standards level. And so when you standardize on one laptop, you know, and let's let's call it a premium laptop, it's probably cheaper in the long run than trying to manage two different laptops. Uh, even a cheaper laptop and, and the premium laptop. And that's because, think about it, from an accessories perspective, you only have to buy one, you know, stock one set of accessories and manage those as standards. Even you don't have to worry about, you know, does this laptop fit in this in this laptop bag or whatever? Um, does this dock station work? Like, it's so complicated. And, and then when things break, um, you know, you could have a small, uh, you know, there's different programs out there, uh, different ways of doing it. Um, you know, one way we see customers have, have gone to like an advanced exchange program that their users are at home. And uh, if, if a device breaks, you know, Compugent has this advanced exchange program where we could ship out a device overnight. I know that some organizations do the same thing themselves internally. Um, but it's great because that customer doesn't have to like drive into the office wait around and, 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 you know, wait for the device to get fixed, then ship it back. Like you, you literally just ship them uh, a new computer and, and often with office 365, you know, they can get through a day um, without having a device. Maybe they use a personal device or their phone. Um, but, but standards is, is, is so important, you know, and, and it enables um, so much cost savings and 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 the cost savings is is really from the operations perspective too and and one thing to, you know to mention about um this concept of a future value so when 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 brent's team provides future value the greatest thing in my opinion being you know my previous life an it manager is it locks in a refresh date and uh i i know that you, you guys you know we've all talked offline about the struggles to get approvals and stuff like that 
Um, in my job as a customer success specialist, I've had customers that, that have actually asked, you know, can we sell you our old fleet and, and you force us to replace that fleet uh, at a certain time because they're struggling to get the approvals internally to replace equipment. And, and that's a huge topic for IT managers and it's, and it's a big problem. So um, that's the added value, I think, of the program that Brent, Brent's team has is uh, it just locks in that date. So there's, you know, they know they're getting new cuts at their new systems for their end users. The end users are happy uh, and they're on that new modern equipment. Bill, I completely agree with that. Um, in fact, I'm working on a, an RFP right now with a large multinational organization. And, you know, the three key objectives within that RFP are cost savings, um, three year lifecycle management and services. And, you know, we asked the, the IT um, director why those were important to him. And, you know, he said that the shorter life cycle uh, means less issues with those devices. It lines up well with the OEM warranty and services that, um, you know, the VAR that they work with are able to provide. It saves them money up front, which is fantastic. It means they can use those funds to uh, potentially fund additional uh, projects that they have that maybe they had to put on the back burner or acquire additional devices. And it puts them into that fixed three-year life cycle. And to Bill's point, it forces them at the end of the 36 months to, you know, have new devices come in. And so at the end of the day, it really makes the IT department's job a lot easier when they're on a shorter fixed life cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Like, what you know, I was at OLG for 13 years and, and CompuTune was actually my supplier. Um, and so it's 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 funny that I've been around CompuTune for, for 15 years now because I've been here two years. Um Listen, I can tell you from my experience, we used to get a couple hundred calls a year from end users saying, when am I getting a refresh? And and the biggest challenge uh, that I had was I, I couldn't tell them because there was no, you know, you, we standardize equipment and we standardize a lot of different offers. Like you're going to get a laptop, but we just need to take that one extra step to say, okay, we've got a three-year life cycle and that's our standard and it's not changing. You know, future value is awesome. It locks it in. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're an organization out there um, and, and your end users are not necessarily happy or your business really needs to have good end users and so that you can, you know, have retention, that's a, that's a huge topic today. I would say that locking in a life cycle and, and communicating that to your end users can can stop a lot of churn. Because think about those 200 calls. I mean, people would be mad. My computer's not performing. When am I getting it? You know, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, that's awfully awkward as a, as a manager or director to be in an organization. So yeah, lock it into three years. Um, if you absolutely have to do four years and communicate it and then stick by it, you know? And, and uh, maybe even proactively tell your end users, hey, um, you're up to get refreshed in November, you know, 2022. And, um, and, and that's going to lead to, you know, better IT operations, in my opinion, and better end user uh, experience and retention and stuff. That is all the time we have today. Be sure to check out our second episode of our podcast on device refreshes with Bill, Brent, and myself. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.